Look at your neighbor and tell them, thank you for coming today. May God bless you. And tell them you may take up your seat and make yourself comfortable and listen to what God is saying. Oh, Jesus. Listen to me. Back in those days, back in those days, there were men whom they called the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. These guys loved God so much. They were so committed to the things of God. They were professionally godly. Professionally, these guys were godly. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the teachers of the law. They were professional godly men. They read the books of Moses. They read the Pentateuch. They had scriptures. They loved God so much. They didn't know the God they were up to. But they loved God. They were so committed to the extent that these guys loved being so righteous and so holy so much. That even their dressing, even their speech, even their everything could portray that they were godly men. They were so righteous outwardly. Even their, just the way they could sit in the synagogues, the way they could talk, the way they could do everything, it's because they were godly. They even had the attires of godliness. Everything they were doing was godly. They kept the law of Moses. They read the law of Moses and the prophets. And they were so committed to the cause of the word of God. They would even kill somebody trying to threaten the word of God. They would kill you. They could fight for God. They would stand in. They were always in the temple, in the synagogue, worshipping and praising God. They preached all over everywhere, spreading the word everywhere. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, now when Jesus comes in place, he made a profound statement in Matthew chapter 5, verse 2. Christ himself saw them. He saw how committed they were. And he saw even their dress code, everything about them was godly. You see the white dress? Godly. So, they were dressed in a godly manner. Everything they were doing was godly. And Jesus came and told his disciples. And he opened his mouth and told them saying, Ah! Give me verse 25. Let me read mine. Verse 25. Ah. I pray I get what I'm saying. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's what I'm looking for. Is it chapter 5? Is it Matthew chapter 5? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus came and saw them very righteous, very holy, very well dressed. Everything they were doing was so good. And even when he looked at them like that, he told the guys, guys, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of these guys, you will never see the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord Jesus. Yes, that is it. Chapter 5. Are we there? For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at that. It means that even though these guys were so good at keeping the law and dressing very well and not killing and not lying and giving and doing everything and going to the synagogues and sleeping there, Jesus said that is not enough for you to go to heaven. Not even heaven alone, but even the kingdom of God. You know the kingdom of God is different from heaven. You know that? Heaven is part of the kingdom of God. We are already in the kingdom and the kingdom is in us, but we are not yet in heaven. You know that? Heaven is part of the kingdom. So he told these guys that you know what? Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you cannot even enter into the kingdom of God. Not even heaven, just the kingdom of God. In other words, you are not even godly. You are not even godly. 
unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you can never enter the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. But do you realize that when you look at the commitment of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you cannot even reach their level of commitment in terms of keeping the law. Please. You cannot help. I mean, you cannot even match a quarter of their standard. You cannot even reach them a quarter way. These guys were so committed. They were moving with the law, keeping it. And Jesus says that unless you exceed them, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And yet, I'm already telling you that it's not practical even for you to practice 10% of what these guys did. And yet, Jesus says that even if you do what they did, you will never enter the kingdom of God unless you surpass that. Because that is still not enough. Praise the Lord. Because for them, if they find you in adultery, they stone you until they kill you. Because they, do, they could not tolerate sin. They couldn't tolerate sin. If they find you sinning, they kill you. If you're a woman and you're caught in adultery, they will kill you. They caught a certain woman in adultery and they wanted to kill the woman. And Jesus supported them and told them, it's okay, kill the woman. So long as you've never done it. Now some of you don't understand that scripture. Some of you think that Jesus told them that you stoned this woman if you've never sinned. Jesus actually meant that if you have never committed the same sin, so it means that these guys were committing the same sin. Praise the Lord Jesus. And God says, unless you supersede them in terms of righteousness, you don't have part in the kingdom. But I told you, it is impractical for you even to do 50% of what these guys did. Because look at the way you are dressed. For them, they even dressed like priests. For you, when you find someone smoking, you pass by them. You are supposed to kill that person. For them, they would kill that person. And for you, don't kill that person. It means you cannot even do what they did. And Jesus is saying that unless you do that and go beyond, you'll never enter the kingdom. So it means that there is a righteousness that exceeds that one of those guys. But I told you that it is impractical to attain it. It is not attainable. God is demanding you to get something that you can't get. And if you don't get it, you'll perish. But I'm telling you, you can't get it. And God wants it. He wants you to exceed these guys in terms of righteousness. But I told you earlier that you can't. And if you don't, you'll perish. So what comes next? Praise the Lord Jesus. So it means that there is a righteousness that exceeds that righteousness. You must first ask yourself, which kind of righteousness do these guys have? Which kind of righteousness? These guys had what you call the righteousness according to the law of Moses. And that righteousness according to the law of Moses is self-righteousness. And that self-righteousness is only outward. Because the Bible says, when you look at a woman lustfully, you have slept with that woman three times. Can you imagine? You have slept with a woman whose name you, are not, you don't even know. It means that women, when our women are walking on the street, they are slept with by several men. On the street. You are driving and you've slept, so far slept with seven since morning. That's what Jesus says. The moment you look at a woman lustfully, before you even know their name, you have slept with them. You see, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Even when you try to master your mindset, the moment you look at a BMW lustfully, you have stolen it. How many cars have you stolen today? <laughs> and they that sin will never enter the kingdom of God. The moment you sin, no heaven. No heaven. You go and look at someone's house last if you've robbed that person's house. Thuggery. Of the highest order. And such people, thieves, murderers, will never enter the kingdom of God. And you are one of them. They will perish in hell. 
Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus told them, you guys, you were stoning this woman who was committed adultery. <clears throat> they told you you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, even if you just look at a woman and you say she's beautiful, why are you saying she's beautiful? You've slept with that woman. Three times, not once. No heaven. And then he told them that when you find a man and you say, you fool, shit, you deserve a hell of fire. How many border border men have changed their lane in the road when you're driving and you say, shit. No heaven. Christ is calling for righteousness. No righteousness. No heaven. But I'm not stealing. But you admire the money. You stole from the bank. Thuggery. He that comes to God must believe that he is the rewarder of they that diligently seek him. For it is impossible to please God without faith. Mark that. When I tell you God will heal you and you lack of faith, you have not pleased God. That is unbelief, which is a sin. You are going to hell. And sin is so terrible, God doesn't want to look at it. The moment he sees sin, he turns his back. So are you sure God is facing you? Don't you think he has given his back? That's what Jesus did. He came and showed them how hard it is to go to heaven. Praise the Lord Jesus. Even when they kept the law, he went further into their hearts and told them, no, I know you have kept the law. You have not slept with women, but you admire them. So it means that you sleep with more women than a prostitute. I don't know if men are also called prostitutes. I'm telling you. It means that you rob banks more than those who rob them physically. A spiritual sin is more significant than a physical sin. Because remember, God looks at the heart. So it is easier for God to notice a sin in the heart than the one outside. Yes. So you are a perpetual sinner. He looks at the And remember, the Holy Spirit is funny. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. He's in your heart. Can you imagine? He even went into your heart to notice sin is properly. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. In the moment you say, I am not going to sin, and you lock yourself in the house, you sin six times. If you were sinning twice, and you say, I will not sin, you sin 20 times. When you say, ah, today I will not, you sin 100 times. The more you stop, the more you do it. The more you stop it, the more you do it. Hell is waiting for people. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, look, look at Moses, the, the chief, the architect of the law himself. He was judged by the law itself. And God didn't even give the law. These guys asked for it and they received it. They asked God to give them the law. And God answered their prayer because when you ask for anything, I will give you. They asked for the law and he gave them. And they failed. They tried to keep it and they failed. Even the chief of the law himself died in the wilderness. It is called the law of Moses, which Moses was killed by the same law. If the architect of the law died by itself, died by the law itself, how about they that are following the architect of the law? The architect himself of the architecture was killed by the architecture. What about they that are following the architecture of the architect who died because of the architecture? Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So when men tried to be so righteous and keep the law and keep the law and keep the law, they became more filthy with the time. Because sin is not an act. Listen to me. I know. You know, revelation is progressive. There are different levels of revelation. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of salvation to they that believe. First to the Jews and then to the Greeks. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Mark the word from faith to faith. 
So revelation is progressive from faith to faith. Faith increases with the time. And as faith increases, revelation also increases. Now, there is a revelation that says that sin is an act committed against God. I know the dictionary will tell you like that. Even the Bible dictionary will tell you like that. But there is a higher revelation to that. That sin is not an act. Sin is a state. Even when you produce a child and lock him in the house until they make a 40 years, they are sinners. What have they seen? Nature. Sin is a state. It's a nature. It's not an act. Don't stop them from sinning. Just to change their nature, they will not sin. Don't stop the toilet from smelling. Just to flush it. It will not smell. When you cover it up, the smell is still there. The moment you open it comes. Flush it. So sin is not an act. It's a nature. It's a state. It's a state. So long as you have a lifeblood that is human, you're a sinner. By default, by nature, you're a sinner. By state, you're a sinner. And there is no heaven for sinners. All people who are called sinners cannot even draw close to God. You can even go look at them. He doesn't look at sin. Praise the Lord Jesus. Even when these guys were so righteous, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the teachers of the law, they spent a lot of time keeping it. And Jesus said, these guys cannot enter the kingdom. Why? It is not how much you repent. How many times you repent? Repentance itself could not even take them to heaven. Between Moses and John the Baptist, repentance never took anybody to heaven. Repentance, never. Never. And God could not even hear the repentance. Sin is so terrible that when men pray, God doesn't even forgive. He doesn't look at it even. Sin is terrible. And once men sin, they are doomed. It's a nature. Even when they repent, repentance will not change their nature. When you say, God, I'm sorry for the sins I've committed, that repentance is not going to change that nature. You're a sinner. And God doesn't look at sin. So he can't look at you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus taught them. He taught them like that. He taught them like that. He taught them like that. When you get a madman and you bathe him and you give him a suit and shoes and shave his hair and release him on the street, he's still a madman. When you find a sinner sinning and you stop him and lock him in the house, in the house he will sin more in his heart. I, I don't know. Am I talking to somebody here? Because God looks at the heart. When you get a dead body and put it on a steering, it's not a driver. It's dead. So sin is the nature. It is a state of being. And once men are like that, they can never enter the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said, Jesus said, in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, this is the Lord speaking through Paul. Then he said, Leave it. Give me Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter. Second Corinthians chapter five. Verse twenty-one. He told them that you know what, guys. For he has made Jesus to be sin for us, whom you know sin. Now you see, Jesus became sin, and yet he knew no sin. Now do you understand that sin is not an act? They are telling you that Jesus never acted in any way that is sinful, but it became sin. If sin was an act, then Jesus would come and commit it in order to become sinful. He made him sin for us who knew no sin. In other words, he never committed any sin for himself, but God made him sin. It means God altered his nature and made him sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus. Now you see, when you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, you have already super, you have already gone beyond 
the righteousness of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Therefore, you satisfy the requirements of entering the kingdom of God. Look at this. For he has made Jesus to be sin for you, and yet he committed no sin, that you might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So, now what God did, he got Jesus Christ. This was like an exchange. You have a hundred dollar bill and you want shillings. You will get 360,000. So God gave Jesus to be in your place. In fact that you can be in the place of Jesus. Because now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are not just righteous. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus came and took on your nature that is sinful. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus knew no sin. He did not commit any sin. But he came and stood in your place. And he became sin for you. So that you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's why we keep telling people, keep the righteousness of God and walk in it. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a lot of time teaching about this message. For a long time, I've started to then I'll continue with it. But listen to me. The only difference that you're going to realize with me is there are two words. Keeping the righteousness of God and walking in it. Those are two different things. Born again believers are, are they that have been recreated. I told that sin is a nature. So what happened when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior? You understand what I'm saying? You are appearing to what he did for you on the cross to undo sin. You are agreeing with what he did for you on the cross to undo sin. You are telling him that I failed. I tried to do it, but I failed. I tried not to sin, but because my nature is sinful, I couldn't stop. So I appeal to what you did on the cross. Let God judge me according to what you did, not according to what I do. So when God wants to judge a man, he judges man according to what Jesus did, not what the man does. Am I talking to you? Now the difference between frustrated grace and good news is one. There are men who say they are righteousness of God. And they say God doesn't care about what I'm doing. And then they behave anyhow and they commit sin. They manifest unrighteousness of the highest order. And they say no, I am the righteousness of God. Now, you, have the, you are the righteousness of God. Okay? And you are keeping that identity. But you are not walking in it. So you have to walk in it. Because when you sin, it doesn't change your nature. You are a recreated person when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. You become born again. So when you get born again in 2003, how old are you by now? 13 years. If it is you got born again before your father, then you're older than your father in the spirit. So sin is not going to change your nature. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Just as the repentance that couldn't change your nature, apart from the repentance of receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, when sinful people do good things, they remain sinful. When righteous people do bad things, they remain righteous. But it means they are not walking in the righteousness of God. So they must a high degree of unrighteousness. That's why they die of cancer, HIV. They are co I'm telling you, unrighteousness itself will manifest itself on you and you will suffer the consequences because you're not walking in it. The nature remains righteous. I'm telling you. But when man looks at you, he sees unrighteousness in manifestation. That's why it is important that they walk in that very righteousness which they received. Because that righteousness of God exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees automatically. Because you have the righteousness of God and you are actually the righteousness of God. If God is righteous, then you are the righteousness of God. That is true. And that is not righteousness by works. It's righteousness by nature. You cannot change your nature by words. You have to be recreated. What happens is when a man gives his life to Jesus is what we call the new birth. It is what we call the new birth. The Holy Spirit recreates you and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
Now that new creature by identity it is the righteousness of God. Not because it has practiced righteousness. No, it is because the Holy Spirit has created it that way. Now that creature must understand its identity in Christ and manifest it. When Mohoz Kainerugaba goes to the bookshop and he steals a book, he will not be jailed. How can you jail a first son? The next president to be sorry. How can you jail a first son because he has stolen a book? Can you do that? But will the first son steal a book because he will not be jailed? When the president of any country steals money, they will never take him to parliament for interrogation. They will never summon him in court because he has stolen money. But do, even when he does it public, he will not be imprisoned because he has stolen money. But should he steal? Because he will not be arrested. So you being a new creature in Christ Jesus, by nature being the righteousness of God, should you continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. The first family is very careful not to offend the public. Yet even if they offend the public, they will not be jailed. You cannot prosecute the first family because they scratched your car. But will they move around scratching people's cars? Their position of being exempted from prosecution even makes them more careful not to commit crime. Am I talking to somebody right here? Their position of being exempted from prosecution, that alone makes them more careful not to commit crime. See, people who are prosecuted commit many crimes. People who have not been prosecuted, they don't commit crime. Ask the lawyers here. The more you prosecute a man, the more criminal he becomes. You've been prosecuting people. Why don't you stop? The more you prosecute, the more you prosecute. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. By the mere fact that a man loves God, even if God tells them that you are already my righteousness, you are exempted from judgment. That man that alone humbles him down not to commit sin. I'm telling you. How did you become a sinner? You were born into it. You were not there when sin was being committed in the Garden of Eden. You were made a sinner by the blood group you carry. Your blood that flows in you has many millions of molecules of sins. The blood itself that you carry is sin. If you, don't, if you want to stop sinning, remove all the blood you have. And then begin to walk on the streets. You are a sinner not because you commit sin. You are a sinner because you were born into the system of sin. You are not righteous. You are not the righteousness of God because you do good things. No. You are the righteousness of God still because you are born into it. Sinners are sinners because they are born into the system of sin. Righteous men are righteous because they are also born again into the system of righteousness. So those guys who are called the righteousness of God should not continue in sin that grace may abound. I have never seen the son of the president in the docks of God. I've never. I've never. And yet he's aware he can't be but he's not moving around killing people. He's the most disciplined male I know in Uganda. That position which he has already makes him to be so careful. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So remember, I told you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's the first thing I said. The second thing I told you, that it is impractical even you have to reach a quarter of those boys, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Meaning to say, men are supposed to perish. As long as a man has not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, they perish. Not because God wants them to perish, but because God does not look at a nature of sin. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. And let me, let, me, let me show something here. Let me show something here. Me, when I gave my life to Jesus, I used to do like this. I, I told people, I used to preach like this. I would tell people, when you begin to pray, 
You spend, you spend some 30 minutes when you are starting to pray. Repenting and putting yourself right. Before you begin to pray. Before you begin to worship. Bandang, let's put ourselves right. Spend some 30 minutes. We did those things that some of you are doing. But those things don't work. When you are putting yourself right that very moment, you are sinning. Because you are trying to tell God that I don't need to appeal to what Jesus did. Me, I can do it myself. It is called self-righteousness. Let me tell you something here. Never do any act. Never do anything with any aim of becoming righteous. By so doing, you are indirectly denouncing God. Never do anything. Never do anything with any aim of becoming righteous. Never. You must tell God that I am already righteous. It is just a free gift given to me which I never deserved. So what I'm going to do, let me keep it and walk in it. I don't want to frustrate it. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you something here. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there were many sacrifices carried out. Whenever you would sin, you will get an animal that was male without, without spot, without blemish. And it, it had to be male without any scar. The firstborn. And then you take it to the priest. You take it to the priest. You confess all your sins on that animal. And the priest gives that animal as an atonement for your sins. But listen to me. What the blood of that animal would do, it would cover up the sins of men. And then you outwardly appear you are righteous. Because that animal's blood has covered your sins. Mark the word cover. Not take away. Cover. And sometimes, men would try their best not to sin. But as the, the more careful they try not to sin, that care itself they exercise is sin. People are not understanding. I think I should skip this. God, give me the grace. I, I'm, I'm telling you that when the guy says, mm, 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 ah, ah, to them not sinning, that itself is sin. <laughs> Sometimes even Job would say, I am not sure. Maybe my children have sinned. Let me go and give a sacrifice. Can you imagine? Job would even just think about it. Even when they have not sinned, he says, mm, you never know they have sinned. And then he goes and makes a sacrifice. But that blood of the animals could just cover up the sins. The animal had to be male, without scar, without spot, without wrinkle. Firstborn, male. Take it for sacrifice. And when you take it, the high priest has to lay hands on the animal. The high priest had to lay hands on the animal. And then it covers the sins. And now, in the theology, in the Bible, in the language of the Spirit, that's what we call a typology. Do you know typology? The Old Testament has typologies, it has prophecies, it has promises. A typology is, is something which is done to symbolize a reality. It, it is something we do to act a reality which is not in place. Now listen to me. That, that, that animal had to be male, firstborn, Without a scar. Without a blemish. And the high priest had to lay hands on it. And then they kill it. As a sacrifice. Jesus was the firstborn. Jesus was male. Jesus had no spot and wrinkle. And the high priest Caiaphas. Laid hands on Jesus. Before they crucified him. So realize that the other animal in the Old Testament. Was the typical of the reality of Jesus. I don't know if you got what I'm saying. Jesus was the firstborn. Jesus had no spot or wrinkle. He was bl blameless. He was the firstborn. He was male. And even Caiaphas, the high priest, laid hands on Jesus. But even Caiaphas himself prophesied and said, you, you guys, why are you stopping us, stopping these organs from killing Jesus? Let them kill Jesus because it is important that one man dies for the entire world. But when he gave that prophecy, the high priest prophesied, but he didn't know what he was saying himself. And when he touched, he came and touched Jesus and said, 
This man must die. Now that touching, there was a fulfillment of a prophecy, but he didn't know. Because even that animal, the high priest had to touch it first. Even Jesus was touched. This man, that touching, was prophetic. Now the difference between the animal and Jesus is that the animal was covering the sins of the world. I mean of people. And yet Jesus himself was taking them away. He, be, he actually he stood in their place and he became those sins. <laughs> Praise the Lord Jesus. Now, when the high priest is going to give him that sacrifice, he goes in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. But before he goes there, they get a chain and they tie on his leg. Or they get a robe and they put on his waist. And then he goes there. Do you know why they put a chain on his leg? Because they say, what if he doesn't come back? He first makes a sacrifice for himself. And then he gets people's sacrifice. And he goes and sacrifices behind the veil. Behind the curtains. Now, if you want your sins to be taken away, your work is to take the animal to be sacrificed. You don't participate in the transaction after giving in the animal. When you give in the animal, it is, the transaction is between God, the high priest, and the animal. You are not supposed to take part in the transaction. For you just take the animal, come back. There are some guys who are working in the temple, they tie a chain on his leg, and they stay this side. Say, ah, and the guy goes behind the chains, I mean the curtains, to give sacrifice. Now when you are here, and you hear the bells, you hear the noise, you hear what? You know he's still alive. But the moment something just, the moment you just hear the place is quiet, then you pull the chain a bit. If he does like this, you say, hey, he's alive. Now, once the sacrifice is accepted, you will know. You always decide you will know. You are not supposed to go to God yourself. You are not even supposed to speak to the high priest and tell him, please hurry. No. Your work is to wait. You don't participate in the forgiveness of your sins. You don't participate. It is the high priest interceding for you with your animal there and the God. You don't participate. It is the work of the high priest to do that work. It is the high priest and the God and, and God himself. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible says that we have a high priest. Is it Romans? Is it Hebrews chapter 8? We have a high priest who is greater than all high priests that we had here on this world. And that is Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Now, when Jesus went to heaven, the Bible says he's there interceding for you and me in heaven. Listen to me. I remember, remember I told you that leave the high priest alone. Your sins are being forgiven as a result of the transaction between God and the high priest and the sacrifice. Not you. You are not involved in the forgiveness of your sins. Now, Jesus being the high priest and is in heaven, praying for guys here on earth. Even now, the forgiveness of your sins is the transaction between God and Jesus. You are not participating. You don't participate. Because those days, when you say, this guy is not coming back, and then you run there, Behind the curtains and say, let me go and see why the high priest is not coming back. You will die from there. You will die from there. You are not supposed to go there. Even now, if you are trying to participate in your righteousness and you think that you can be righteous by what you are doing and by what you are not doing, it means you are entering behind the curtains. You will die from there. It's not up to you. It's about what Christ himself did for you. Even those days, it was about what the high priest did for you. Isn't it? Your forgiveness of your sins, the covering of your sins, was as a result of what the high priest did for you behind the curtains. Not, it was not about what you did. It was about what the high priest did for you behind the curtains. And you never participated. So long as you give in your God, you look on. Isn't it? Even now, the order has not changed. It is between the high priest who is Jesus and his father God. Your work is to receive even in those days, their work was to receive. Even now, it has not changed. Your work is to receive freely the gift of righteousness. But now there is a caution I'm giving. To walk in it as well. Ah! Clap your hands to Jesus. Listen to me. I told you 
that sin itself is not an act. It's a state. When Jesus was put on the cross, when Jesus was put on the cross, hmm, oh, there is nowhere in the Bible where you're going to find a scripture where Jesus is calling his father God. He called him father. There was too much intimacy between Jesus and his father. He was calling him father, 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 father. There was too much intimacy that he could not even say Lord. He could say father. It's a very high level of intimacy. When Jesus was taken to the hill of Golgotha at Calvary, as the sacrifice for your sins, that Golgotha of Calvary was the, behind the curtains. Are we together? I don't know. Are we together? And Jesus going there, there is only one thing that Mel Gibson didn't act very well in that movie. That guy who acted the Passion of the Christ, he is my best actor. He acted very well, except for this part. The Bible says that when Jesus was being led to be crucified, he was like a sheep being taken. He could not open his mouth. Now what Mel Gibson did in his movie, that guy Mel, for him what he did, when they were beating Jesus, Jesus was crying. He never cried. Mel Gibson in his movie laments. The cross throws him down, then he laments. Jesus was quiet. Because he knew what he was sorting out. He knew what he was doing. It was important that he be killed. He knew it. Remember there is a time they were going to arrest him. And he asked them, whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. They went back and fell down. Meaning to say, they, he could not be arrested. He had too much power. He could elect to shoot men. He would even call battalions of angels to come and strike these guys with the lightning. But he didn't do that. Why? He knew what he was doing. What makes the death of Jesus exceptional is this. When a man is being beaten like that, he cries. He laments. For him he didn't. Because he knew what he was doing. He knew that it, he was a sheep being taken for slaughter. Remember those sacrifices which were being taken behind for the high priests to slaughter. Those sacrifices were not making noise. They were not. They were not. They were quiet. They could go like this. They were very quiet. Tony Jesus.